are we on? I'm just a second or two late this morning. Uh, already I've been to Trader Joe's and to Michael's, uh, or at least in the parking lot. Uh, and after this, we have to go shopping more places. This is our Thursday shopping day. So, excuse me if my beard is mussed up with from my mask. <laughs> but anyway, today we're continuing with Chapter 3. We're starting Chapter 3 of Angels, Demons, and Gods of the New Millennium. I, I hope we're... It, I hope we're live. It looks like we're, looks like we are. This chapter is called The Emerald Tablet of Hermes and the Invocation of the Holy Guardian Angel. And it's a long one, so we're just going to uh, uh, do part one of it today. starts off with an epigram, which is uh, uh, a quote from the invocation of uh, uh, Mercury, from the rite of Mercury, uh, from the rites of Aloysius by Aleister Crowley. O thou Lord of Harmony, Master of the right will, thou who hast brought unto us the divine seeds of self-knowledge, we, the humble servants of the children of thy voice, we call on thee to lead us out of our ignorance. We call on thee, O thrice holy. And I'm going to take the phone off the hook here. So, so those real estate people won't keep calling us, thinking we're homeowners. <clears throat> Certainly one of the most significant events to impact the modern study of Hermeticism was the English translation in 1888 of the Book of the Sacred Magic of Abramelin the Mage. And I'm referring to the, the Mathers trans, uh, translation, uh, which was published in that year. And we've since discovered that uh, that was just a translation of a partial manuscript, but that's another story. Unlike other grimoires supposedly written by King Solomon, Moses, or various prophets and patriarchs, authorship of the sacred magic is attributed to a bona fide historical personage with rather impressive credentials. Abraham the Jew. 1362 to 1460. Uh, he's otherwise known as Abraham of Worms or Worms. A German Jew was perhaps the most famous alchemist magician of his day. He certainly was among the wealthiest. A pious Kabbalist of great renown, he nevertheless was not above displaying his magical and alchemical prowess for the amusement of the rich and powerful. In his heyday, he delighted and astonished the likes of King Henry VI of England, Pope John XXIII, yes, Pope John XXIII, uh, the modern one was the second Pope John XXIII, go figure. Uh, Pope Benedict XIII, Gregory XII, Emperor Constantine of uh, Pale Paleologos of uh, Greece, uh, Emperor uh, Sigismund of Germany, and the Duke uh, Leopold of Saxony. An insatiable seeker of wisdom, Abraham traveled extensively in search of even more profound secrets of nature and the divine. In Egypt, he was told of a desert hermit, a powerful mage known as Abra Melin, who held the keys to a supreme magical secret. Abraham sought out and found this great wizard and was allowed to live and study for a time with the old man. 
after exhorting his new student to leave an, lead an austere and pious life, Abramelin consciously, or excuse me, cautiously turned over two small books which outlined the sacred magic. Abraham the Jew claimed that the magical powers he obtained from the mastery of the magic of Abramelin protected him for the rest of his life and that they were the source of his success, fame, and great riches. Shortly before his death, he bequeathed to his two sons the greatest treasures of his long and colorful life. To his eldest son, Joseph, he transmitted the secrets of the Holy Kabbalah. To his youngest son, Lamech, he bestowed the sacred magic of Abramelin the Mage. Now, as quaint as the above story may be, the book of the sacred magic of Abramelin the Mage might have remained just another footnote among the voluminous, voluminous aggregation of occult literature of that period. If not for one bombshell of a postulation that serves as the cornerstone of the Abramelin operation, a concept that catapults the work far above its contemporary grimoires and makes the sacred magic a spiritual science equivalent to the highest yogic practices of the East. Abramelin reveals that each of us is linked to a spiritual being whom he calls the Holy Guardian Angel. Until we've become spiritually wedded to this being, we are not fully equipped as human beings to rule the denizens of our lower nature or advanced, or advanced spiritually. The primary focus of the Abramelin operation is union, which he calls knowledge and conversation, of one's own holy guardian angel. Until this is accomplished, it's useless even to attempt to manipulate the circumstances of life, because we are yet spiritually unprepared to adequately comprehend the nature of our true will, let alone competent to exercise that will upon the cosmos. After knowledge and conversation is achieved, the angel becomes the magician's counselor and directs form, uh, from a position of supreme wisdom all subsequent magical activities. This is a striking philosophical departure from the ceremonial magic practices that were popular among the contemporaries of Abraham the Jew. Solomonic magic texts, so-called because they were supposedly derived from the magical writings of King Solomon, place the magician in the position of whining to an all-powerful yet inexplicably gullible God to temporarily be allowed to address the spirits with borrowed divine authority. Literally, attempting to bluff the infernal minions into believing they're being conjured by a, a new Moses or Elijah or Solomon. The technique is not dissimilar to that of a spoiled rich boy coercing his powerful father into a, allowing him to beat the butler. This is not to say that such magical practices are ineffectual. On the, on the contrary, they can achieve seemingly astounding results and phenomena. All magic activity, whether guided by the perfect wisdom of the holy guardian angel or by the most unworthy motives of an unenlightened villain, sets into motion a chain reaction of unseen effects that seek and eventually find a medium in which to discharge the energy of the working. 
If the magician's spiritual sight is clear, then the momentum of the entire universe impels the energy to find its perfect mark. And the object of the operation is accomplished. However, if the magician is deluded as to any aspect of the circumstances surrounding the working, then the energy generated by the ceremony will seek out the path of least resistance and eventually miscarry as a malignant tumor in the fertile soil of the magician's own delusion. Unless one is divinely inspired by the Holy Guardian Angel, he or she will continue to operate in the dark, motivated by ill-considered desires and guided by defective powers of perception. While the term Holy Guardian Angel used in this capacity appears to have originated with the sacred magic of Abermelon the Mage. The concept of a personal divine entity is unquestionably much older. Zoroaster writes of the Agatha, excuse me, Ag, Agathoth, Agathoth, Thos Diamon. I'll say that again. I'll spell it for you. A G A T H O S D A I M O N. Agathos. Agath. Well, anyway. The, the Agathos Daemon. A, per, a personal guardian spirit who must be contacted before any theurgic ceremony is initiated. These spiritual guides were called Iungus, or ferrymen, and together with the Sinukes and the Teletarchi, compromise the primary hierarchy of Chaldean archangels. The Platonic philosophers taught that between humanity and the gods there exists an intermediate class of spiritual uh, beings called daemonos. Each individual is assigned a personal daemon, and it is the daemon, not the gods, who directly hears and answers our prayers and the prayers of our race. Socrates called his daemon genius. Spirit guides who from historic times have shepherded the shamanic visions of every culture on earth serve to demonstrate that the holy, excuse me, that the guard, knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel is a fundamental and universal spiritual experience. Jesus said, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Krishna told Arjuna, Only by single-minded devotion I may in this form be known and seen in reality, and also entered into. Everywhere we look within the sacred writings and spiritual practices of the world's religions, we find the basic theme of a personal relationship with a spiritual being who is the representative of, or the conduit to, a supreme and perhaps impersonal deity. So ingrained is this basic truth upon the collective unconscious of the race that we find it embedded deeply in our myths and fairy tales. It takes no stretch of the imagination to see the HGA as the prince who awakens with a kiss the sleeping princess. The prince is the HGA, the kiss is the knowledge and conversation, and the princess is the unenlightened soul. And takes her to the palace of his father, the king, 
God, where the new couple will eventually become a king and queen themselves, supreme enlightenment and reabsorption into Godhead. Angel, by definition, means messenger. And students of the Western tradition will recognize the concept of such a divine intermediary as decidedly mercurial in nature. Hermes, Mercury, is the messenger of the gods and psychopomp of the dead. Avatars of the world's great religions have all represented themselves as guides, shepherds, and messengers of divine truth. The fact that the God's need of messenger reveals that direct communication with and between the gods, and by gods we might, uh, might say vibratory frequencies, levels of consciousness or degrees of awareness. So the fact that the gods need a messenger uh, uh, reveals the fact that the, uh, excuse me, that direct communication between the, the gods uh, is, is not a good idea. <laughs> Remember the fatal consequences when Zeus, Zeus's mortal lover, uh, Semele, demanded to see him without his insulated pajamas. Jehovah didn't appear to Virgin Mary to announce uh, she had his bun in her oven. The archangel Gabriel did. Jesus, excuse me, Zeus didn't go to the underworld to tell his brother Hades to give Persephone time off for good behavior. He sent Hermes to deliver the bad news and lead the lady back. Thoth was forever jotting down notes and messages and frequently interceded in the family squabbles of the gods of Egypt. In the Mahabharata, Krishna delivered so many messages back and forth between the Kurus and the uh, Panchalas that he probably reached Brahmaloka just on frequent flyer mileage alone. It's unfortunate that the religions of the masses have presumed to ignore this central and universal theme and have mistaken their messengers for the message. As it were, worshiping the advertisement rather than the product itself. Perhaps it's impossible to develop a religion for the masses around such a personal and intimate experience. Yet, if we allow ourselves the freedom of an open mind, we can witness the holy guardian angel dancing on the street corner in the unbridled bliss of the Hare Krishna devotee, and hear its song in the Muslim's poignant call to worship. I have watched in awe as a babushka-hooded Polish grandmother opened her toothless mouth to receive the consecrated host at Mass, her eyes fixed in ecstasy upon an unseen wonder as she dissolved in the body of her holy guardian angel, whom she saw as Christ. Like the Buddhist monk who sees the pure Buddha nature in a steaming pile of dog excrement, there will always be those individuals who will seize the pure core truth of their religion, no matter how idiotic and superfluous trappings of their particular creed may be. It's a sad irony that with few exceptions, the great religions of the West insist on short-circuiting the spiritual wiring of their adherents by demanding that they accept an exclusive and crystallized image of the Holy Guardian Angel. 
the Holy Guardian Angel is more than the projected image of our perfected self or the voice of our conscience. It is more than the innocent, inherent knowledge between right and wrong. It is more than the divine ear that hears us when we look to heaven and pray, Oh God, if you just get me out of this, I'll never do anything so stupid again. But what that more than is, is difficult to discuss. Abramelin doesn't even spend much time trying. Get your angel and have him explain seems to be the thrust of his advice. And in the final analysis, it's probably the wisest counsel. Nevertheless, since knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel is of such supreme importance to the spiritual career of the aspirant, it might be helpful to see how the concept might be more clearly illustrated. And to do this, I will briefly review the basic Kabbalistic principles as they relate to the fundamental document of Hermeticism, the Emerald Tablet of Hermes. And that's where we'll pick it up tomorrow. We'll start on the Emerald Tablet of Hermes as it relates to knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. I hope you've enjoyed this morning's talk, and I hope you'll be with us every morning at this time, 10 o'clock, every day, rain or shine. I wish there was a little more rain at the moment here. I don't know where it is where you are, but it's been terribly dry and on fire. But anyway, have a good Thursday. I'm off to the adventure of shopping. See you tomorrow. Continue to be good to yourself and good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.